Just a quick reminder that my other channel, Great Books Explained, can be found in the link below. Same concept as this channel, films that celebrate the arts using clear, concise language and no gimmicks. Please subscribe and press the notification bell. Thank you. At the age of eight, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, the child prodigy, was presented to the Pope, who prophetically announced that the child would be the Michelangelo of his age. Bernini would not only raise the sculpted human figure to unseen levels of realism, but he would dominate the 17th century like no other. As a painter, an architect, as a playwright, and of course, as a sculptor and come to be seen as the embodiment of the age of the Baroque. He was also an arrogant, hot-tempered, narcissistic man and unscrupulous in his pursuit of personal glory. He was in his early 20s when he created this work, which tells the story of the terrified nymph Daphne, who is pursued by the love-struck Apollo. As he grabs her, she cries out to the gods for help and is transformed into a laurel tree. Her limbs grow heavy, her arms become branches, her breasts become solid bark. And as her fingertips sprout leaves, her feet take root and stop Apollo in his tracks. There is simply no question as to whether this is a masterpiece. There is, however, the question we do have to ask. What is the biggest miracle here? The literal metamorphosis of gods? or the sculptor's metamorphosis of solid marble into living flesh and blood. It's no wonder Gian Lorenzo Bernini was arrogant and narcissistic, as from the second the infant could hold a pencil, he had been told that he was a genius touched by God. His father Pietro from Florence was also a sculptor, who arrived in Rome with his family in the early 17th century. It was a city with a wealth of job opportunities for artists. Popes and cardinals were building lavish churches, monuments and villas. And by the time Pietro arrived, it was estimated that of the 100,000 citizens of Rome, 4,000 of them were artists. Rome was the place for a sculptor to find work. Pietro himself was a mediocre sculptor, but he had a secret weapon. Gian Lorenzo, who was born in 1598, who so astonished Pope Paul V at the age of eight with the stone head he had carved and his drawing skills, that the Pope told the young boy to take as much gold as his little arms could carry. It was his first taste of financial success and a preview of things to come. Bernini would work for eight popes and be paid an absolute fortune. He would die at the age of 82, world famous, honored, wealthy, and yes, still being compared to Michelangelo. The Pope appointed Cardinal Maffeo Barberini to watch over the boy Wanda and arrange for his education. He received a classical training, studying and sketching the Greek and Roman masterpieces in the Vatican museums, while at the same time he helped his father with his commissions. Then the roles reversed and his father became his assistant and helper, while Gian Lorenzo was just a teenager. Pietro seemed happy enough and reveled in his son's fame and reputation, just as his own career was coming to an end. One of Gian Lorenzo's earliest sculptures is this one, carved at the age of just 12. And while still a teenager, he produced his first masterpiece. It is the story of his namesake, San Lorenzo, or Saint Lawrence, who was a Christian martyr burned alive on a red-hot griddle. Michelangelo was Bernini's hero. He read everything he could about him, studied his work intensely and spoke openly about his desire to be his equal. He was inspired by many of the master's works and it is said that he based his San Lorenzo on the positioning of Michelangelo's Pieta. 
but Bernini managed to do something his hero never quite managed, to create realistic and believable flesh out of marble. The flames that burn San Lorenzo are a real tour de force. Hard enough to depict in paint, but to carve out of marble? Impossible, they all said. And yet Bernini's portrayal of leaping flames is so realistic we can almost feel the heat. Where we see the true mastery of the young sculptor is in what would become his trademark, textures. In the case of San Lorenzo, flesh, hair, wood, metal and flame. The statue was Bernini's calling card. It is as if the teenage boy, at the threshold of his career, is announcing to the world that he has arrived. To get the saint's expression of being tortured and yet undergoing some kind of spiritual epiphany at the same time, Gian Lorenzo was said to have placed his own leg against a red-hot brazier and sketched his own pained expression while looking in a mirror. He would do the same thing two years later for this statue. You could say that he was a method sculptor. Bernini was the talk of Rome, and all the great cardinal benefactors wanted him in their stable of artists. But that honour went to the incredibly wealthy Scipione Borghese, nephew and close friend to Pope Paul V, who grabbed the young genius for his own. In 1607, Scipione Borghese began construction of a grand villa on the Pincian Hill, then on the outskirts of Rome. This is the building Apollo and Daphne was made for, and today the Villa Borghese is a public museum, where we still find Apollo and Daphne. Borghese wielded enormous power as the Pope's secretary and effective head of the Vatican government, and he used the immense wealth that he acquired, not always legitimately, to assemble one of the largest and most impressive art collections in Europe, with paintings by Caravaggio, Raphael and Titian, and works of ancient Roman art, and now Bernini will create four masterpieces for him. Borghese was an unsavoury character, filthy rich and ruthless in his pursuit of more wealth and power. It was a good match. Bernini himself was equally ruthless and would step on anyone's toes to get to the top, creating a string of enemies. Later, he would maim his mistress and try to murder his own brother. But successive popes forgave him because his talent was useful for their own posterity. Borghese paid the sculptor huge sums to work for him, and that's all Bernini cared about. This bust of the Cardinal Borghese is just as revolutionary as his other sculptures in the Borghese collection. It shows a real man rather than an idealised one. Bernini used all his sculptural tools, different sized chisels, small drills and rasps to create different textures and make the cardinal come to life, even polishing his cheeks and nose to make it look like he is sweating. He also managed to capture the twinkle of the cardinal's eye by cutting deep into the iris to create a shadow at just the right place to capture the light. The detail of the corpulent cardinal's button not quite making it through the buttonhole is a classic Bernini touch. It is the same attention to detail that we will see with Apollo and Daphne. But before this, between 1621 and 1625, the new Borghese sculptor began to create innovative pieces for the cardinal that would become touchstones of the Baroque style. Borghese commissioned four radical and colossal marble statues. Aeneas, Ancaeus and Ascanius fleeing Troy, David, the Rape of Persephone and Apollo and Daphne. Never had statues been so dramatic, so animated and so intensely alive. Nobody had seen anything quite like them before. And people came from all over Rome to see what were then being called miracles. These four masterpieces would firmly establish Bernini as Rome's greatest sculptor while he was still in his mid-twenties. Bernini was the new Michelangelo. For a sculptor who is such a brilliant storyteller, it comes as no surprise that Bernini was deeply committed to the world of theatre and illusion, putting on many productions of his own for patrons like the Barberini family, not just designing sets as many artists did, but also producing, staging, writing and even acting in plays, 
as well as inventing ingenious scenic effects. The Eternal City has become a sort of Venice and then some. In 1638, after the Tiber River flooded in Rome, Bernini staged his own celebrated play called Inundation of the Tiber, where boats floated across the stage on real water until suddenly the embankments on stage broke apart and water spilled out towards the screaming audience, who were saved from a soaking when a barrier rose just in time to stop it. He also staged operas, which was a new art form at the time, and it is no coincidence that one of the most flamboyant theatrical art forms really came into its own during the Baroque. In 1517 in Germany, Martin Luther condemned the excesses and corruption of the Roman Catholic Church and initiated the Protestant Reformation that would sweep through Europe and change the religious, political and artistic landscape for all time. From 1545 to 1563, meetings of Catholic clerics called the Council of Trent was convened with the primary purpose to condemn the growing beliefs of Protestants. The Protestant Church criticised the cult of images, but the Catholic Church saw art as a powerful propaganda tool and a means of stimulating the public's faith in the Church. Drama, intense realism, movement and colour became the artist's tools in the fight back for Catholic souls, producing art that would instruct and inspire. In 1597, Cardinal Farnese commissioned Annibale Caracci's great masterpiece, the ceiling of the Palazzo Farnese, the most influential work of art in Rome since that of the Sistine Chapel. We can now consider Caracci's fresco cycle to be a turning point in art, a departure from the classical ideals of the Renaissance, embracing a more emotional, dynamic and theatrical approach to art, which was to become a characteristic of the Baroque period. The ceiling imagery was a move away from 16th century paintings like this and an anticipation of the development of the Baroque in the 17th century, just three years away. It was an inspiration for the next generation of artists like Bernini. The Baroque took place in the 17th and first half of the 18th century. It was a highly ornate and elaborate style of architecture, art and design characterised by a grandeur, drama, movement and emotional intensity that set it apart from the more restrained and balanced aesthetics of the Renaissance. The Vatican used art to counteract the perceived austerity of Protestant religious spaces. It became a powerful way of conveying complex theological ideas through vivid and easily understandable visual narratives. If the Renaissance was all about carefully balanced proportions, stable forms and control, solid shapes that anchor the work, Baroque is known for drama and movement, for instability and dynamism. I would say the word theatrical really sums it up. In Baroque sculpture, led largely by the work of Gian Lorenzo Bernini, the figure took on new importance, always in perpetual motion. He showed a dynamism not seen before. His figures reached out into the viewer's space in a frozen moment in time, sometimes not more than a nanosecond. This extraordinary David was the last in a series of commissions by Scipione Borghese, created before Apollo and Daphne, but it is useful to look to David when talking about the Baroque. Bernini's David was inspired by this classical statue owned by the Cardinal but he was also inspired by this image from the aforementioned Farnese ceiling, Karachi's portrayal of the giant Polyphemus preparing to hurl a stone to kill the youth, Aces. We can compare these two famous Davids to get an idea of the move from Renaissance to Baroque. As I showed in my video, Michelangelo's David is preparing himself for action, planning and deliberating. Bernini's David is in full swing, a split second away from hurling the stone towards us, the viewer. Whereas Michelangelo's David is the whole story, Bernini's is a frozen split second. Michelangelo portrays thought, Bernini, action. They are both naturalistic statues, 
But whereas Michelangelo's impassive and beautiful David is godlike and keeps us at a distance, Bernini's hero involves us, penetrating our space with its intense emotionalism, its incredible energy as well as its actual physical presence. His lips are pursed, his eyes are on the prize, and his brow is furrowed. In fact, the face of David is a self-portrait of Bernini, who supposedly had his friend, Maffeo Barberini, later Pope Urban VIII, hold a mirror as he sculpted. The expression of concentration on Bernini's face, the biting of the lip, could be a realistic portrayal of the sculptor chiseling away. Chiaroscuro, the use of light and shadow, comes into play here too. The Baroque painter Caravaggio was the master of Chiaroscuro and had painted David 20 years earlier with the same shocking realism, the same dynamism and the same sense of theatre. You can see that in the case of Michelangelo's David, it is evenly lit, relatively shadow-free and therefore tone-free. But with Bernini, and the Baroque in general, there is a greater contrast between light and dark. Baroque artists embraced chiaroscuro to create a sense of tension and energy. And Bernini achieved this by deep carving and undercutting, carving out different depths of recesses. This not only added to the dynamic quality of his sculptures, but also allowed for areas of deep shadow, contributing to the chiaroscuro effect. He used new ideas to make marble mutate so realistically that we believe hair flows in the wind and hard stone really is the flesh of gods. Bernini embodied the Baroque, not only with his dynamic and exuberant style, but also his focus on emotional expressionism. It was a form of realism that ushered in a new era in European sculpture. The sculpture of Apollo and Daphne was made between 1622 and 1625, and it captures a moment from Ovid's Metamorphoses, an alarming depiction of unwanted desire. It depicts the mythological story of Apollo, the god of arts, prophecy and music, pursuing Daphne, a nymph associated with nature. In the myth, Apollo is struck by Cupid's arrow, causing him to fall in love with Daphne. However, Daphne, who has been struck by an arrow of aversion, recoils from Apollo's advances. About to be caught by Apollo, Daphne cries out to her father, a river god, for help. Change and destroy this body, which has given too much delight, she screams. Bernini captures the exact moment of transformation as Daphne begins to turn into a laurel tree to escape Apollo's advances. Bernini's figures are engaged in a dramatic chase. At the precise moment Apollo reaches out to grab Daphne and wraps his hand around her torso, Daphne cries out to her father and her body transforms into twigs and leaves. Her toes begin to sprout roots and the bark springs up from the earth to protect her, much to the surprise of Apollo. It is a snapshot, a frozen moment. At first glance, it seems there is body contact between the two figures, but actually, they don't touch at all. Flora and fauna has grown between them, and bark, leaves and twigs grow up to preserve Daphne's purity. Apollo's hand does appear to touch Daphne's flesh, but in fact touches bark, which has grown up to protect her body and sheathe her modesty. It all happens so quickly that, as Ovid tells us in Metamorphoses, Apollo could feel Daphne's heart still beating beneath the bark. Before Bernini, only painters had tackled this story. We know the sculptor looked to this statue in the Vatican collection for inspiration for Apollo's face. And I'm sure the artist knew that his hero, Michelangelo, had used the same inspiration for his Christ in the Sistine Chapel. Bernini also knew of this anonymous engraving in the Vatican collection. A sculptural source is this Mannerist statue, which shows a different story from Ovid's Metamorphoses on the same theme of a pursuit and transformation. The expression on Apollo's face is one of confusion and amazement, as if he has just realised what is happening and that he will never have Daphne. She too is beginning to realise the consequences of her plea to the gods, and we can see the life 
her humanity being drained out of her. It is as if she is gasping for what she knows will be her last breath before she becomes a laurel tree. But it is motion which makes this statue so powerful. You can feel the thrust of the movement through the figures and Apollo's cloak which swirls around him in mid-air. Heavy marble statues need stability and support and are designed carefully to be solid and balanced. But Bernini, being Bernini, dangerously extends the male protagonist's leg outward and unsupported in mid-air, giving the statue a diagonal thrust and an active motion we would usually only find in paintings. It is a risky strategy that paid off. In the same way a painter uses colour, Bernini uses textures to separate the components. The skin is highly polished and smooth to reflect light and give us realistic flesh. A contemporary discussed how the figures looked like they were perspiring, and if the light hits it right, they do, which is achieved through burnishing and polishing the marble. The hair of both Apollo and Daphne is left matte and unpolished to contrast with their skin. Daphne's hair twists back into grooves into which Bernini cut the occasional contrasting groove which catches the light giving the illusion of highlights suggesting she is blonde. Apollo's hair by contrast is a thick mop of curls achieved by deep skillful drilling of recesses. Apollo's cloak is a complete contrast from his skin. It is smooth and the surface has been textured to look like woven cloth. The laurel leaves are waxy and smooth, just like the real thing. Just look at them. It's hard to imagine that these delicate paper-thin leaves are carved out of a brittle substance like marble, which so easily could snap, with just the pressure of a finger. The highlight in their eyes is done with the most delicate of touches. The iris is left unpolished, but the pupil is burnished smooth to capture light at the right angle. No one has carved marble before in such a naturalistic way as Bernini did. He didn't just create reality, he made it so much better. Bernini was very conscious of us, the viewer, and how we move around statuary. Looking at it from different perspectives, it means that it seems to be in motion as we encircle it. A revelation in the early 17th century and even now is astonishing. He often placed his sculptures in specific locations within architectural settings that maximized the impact of natural or artificial light. This allowed light to fall on the sculptures in a specific way that enhanced their three-dimensional qualities and emphasized light and shadow, chiaroscuro. The statue has remained in the same room in Villa Borghese since 1622, but was originally in a different position. Instead of the centre of the room where it is today, it was against the west wall by the entrance door, and Bernini planned for it to be viewed from behind and on the statue's right side, so that as you walked into the room, it was as if you were following Apollo and saw the transformation as it happened in real time. One experienced it in the same way Apollo did, and therefore understood the narrative of the story instantly, without the need to move position. The left side of the statue was not meant to be so clearly on display the way it is today, and that is more obvious when you compare the two sides. On the right side, how Bernini meant it to be viewed, the details appear to be impossibly light and fragile, whereas from the left side, neither face is visible from this perspective, nor is much of Daphne's body. Bernini has put all the mechanics that hold the statue together, the carefully designed solid interlinking forms that connect and support one another on the left, lesser seen side. Even at a young age, Bernini had an impossible workload and so created his own workshop. And this meant a group of students working together under his guidance. They all lived together, ate together and created together almost like a boarding school. Today in art schools, the aim is to find your own voice, your own methods. But in this period, the goal of the student was simply to copy the master. They learned how to sculpt or paint like him and would help by sculpting some of the details. 
Early on, they would just create basic shapes. Later, they might specialize in drapery, and later still, work on the figures. Some of the real virtuoso carving on Apollo and Daphne was done not by Bernini, but by his workshop. One of those assistants, Giuliano Finelli, was particularly adept at working with a small drill to carve the finer details like roots, twigs and bark. The problem is that Bernini never acknowledged the gifted Finelli. But to be fair, this was standard practice, and it still is. Many modern-day artists still use teams of unknown assistants. It is a way for young artists to hone their craft. Finelli quit the workshop and became the first of many enemies Bernini made, thanks to his ruthless pursuit of personal fame. Like Auguste Rodin, Bernini certainly never needed any help with his overall ideas and imagination, just the technical skill of carving. It was simply a time-saving measure. And Finelli, while highly skilled, was still just a hired hand, who went on to have an illustrious career of his own. His importance in this story is minimal. In 1621, at just 23 years old, Gian Lorenzo Bernini received a knighthood from Pope Gregory XV. Two years later, the new Pope, Urban VIII, the man who once held up Bernini's mirror as he sculpted David, became his greatest benefactor, employing him to redesign and in fact redefine Rome. Like Michelangelo, he would be Rome's chief architect. So much of the theatrical grandeur we imagine when we think of Rome was created by Bernini, who used the city as if it were a stage setting for his greatest productions. The history of Bernini is the history of papal Rome. He sculpted the most sublime angels for bridges, created fountain after fountain for public squares, framed ancient Egyptian obelisks throughout the city, designed churches and ceilings and domes, thrones for saints and outrageously theatrical sculptures. He designed an ingenious masterpiece to cover the papal altar over the ancient tomb of St. Peter. A committed Catholic, he also created statues for the faithful, which included one of his most controversial and possibly erotic works. But perhaps there is one work of his more than any other that represents Bernini's Rome, St. Peter's Square. He created public spaces in the way he created sculptures, as a way of communicating with the space of the viewer. And Bernini's design for St. Peter's Square has a remarkable sense of harmony and unity. The square, Orovato Tondo, is shaped from two intersecting circles of equal diameter. In the middle of the square is an enormous obelisk from ancient Egypt, and that acts as a sundial. Bernini has used the obelisk as a sort of pivot when designing the square. The arms of the colonnades are a section of each circle, designed to symbolize the motherly embrace of the church, reaching out to encircle the faithful, creating a sense of security and protection for up to 100,000 visitors and pilgrims. It is still an unrivaled urban space and a masterful addition that physically links Bernini to Michelangelo, the architect of St. Peter's. Few artists have ever come close to the status and stardom known by Bernini, sculptor, architect, painter, and the designer of Rome as we know it. He spent practically his whole working life in the Eternal City, and everywhere he went, he was feted and mobbed by huge crowds. But as Bernini himself predicted, he would be dismissed after his death, and like so many artists of the Baroque, be written out of art history. Seen as overly stylized, too extravagant and overdramatic, the 18th and 19th century saw Bernini and virtually all Baroque artists criticized by art historians and ignored by the public, including Caravaggio. This happened more often than not in the non-Catholic countries of Northern Europe and particularly in Victorian England. But in the 20th century, critics began to recognize Bernini's achievements and slowly began to restore his artistic reputation. And now he, like Caravaggio, is seen as one of Baroque's supreme masters. 
Gian Lorenzo Bernini was the last of Italy's universal geniuses, a polymath who can take his place alongside his hero, Michelangelo.